Thank you very much, Curtis, and a pleasure to be here and speaking to everybody today on the line. My name is Christopher Jackson. I am the CEO of Proteum, a Green Hydrogen UK focus project developer and the chair of the UK's Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. I am delighted to be able to host you here for our event with Burgess Salmon and the Hydrogen Council on hydrogen's role in the post-COVID recovery for the UK and international. Uh, we've got a great array of speakers here for you today to go through what I think is going to be a very fascinating and detailed series of discussions. Um, we're going to start by just going through uh, the agenda with you for today before we move into the discussion. So, Curtis, if you'd be so kind as to move to the next slide. So, I'm going to provide a brief introduction to you on the UK HFCA and some context around uh, hygiene uh, in the international UK context. I'm going to then hand over to Pierre Etienne Franck, who is the Secretary for the Hygiene Council. We will provide a further global context on what the Hydrogen Council has been doing and also hydrogen as it's been evolving over the last few years. We will then have a Q&A discussion between myself and Pierre Tien to help set the stage for a panel discussion. And I'm delighted that for our panel discussion, we have so many wonderful speakers. Uh, from Sarah's Power, we have Elizabeth Skerritt, the Director of Communications and Investor Relations. From Anglo-American, we have Mark Freed, Head of Market Development. From Johnson Matthew, we have Sam French, Senior Business Development Manager. And for Burgess Salmon, we have Brian Thomas, uh, Thompson, sorry, Thomas, uh, the head of transport for Burgess Salmon. Um, and following that, there'll be a Q&A where we'd love to take your questions and feedback, um, and we'll be moderating those through the Q&A section that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and then there'll be some closing comments. Uh, this is being recorded, so we will share a recording after the, uh, the webinar is completed. And if you do want to get in touch, there will also be um, a number of emails at the end of this, so you can reach out to us afterwards. So with that, Curtis, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So, uh, and, and next slide, please, Curtis. Thank you very much. So thank you, everybody. Um, for this discussion, I want to just briefly start with an introduction to who the UK HFCR, FCA are, for those who may not be familiar with us. So we are um, a trade association representing the whole spectrum of businesses in the hydrogen and fuel cell industry across the United Kingdom. Uh, we work to help businesses to commercialize their products, but also to work with government, to work with end users, and to also find opportunities not only for deployment in the UK, but also for international export opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, we cover quite a broad range of different companies. Uh, Curtis, if you could please go to the next slide. So across our membership of roughly 50 companies, we have businesses such as um, ITM Power, CPH2, and uh, we're on the electrolysis side, we then have leading businesses like Anglo-American and Ceres, as well as Johnson Matthew, who you'll be hearing from later on our panel, things like Air Products and VOC. Uh, and all in our members have global annual revenues of about 400 billion and 200,000 employees. So a huge range of very influential large industry groups that cover the whole spectrum of the supply chain, all the way from raw materials through to end technologies. Um, and I think that's what gives us a really great opportunity to talk about the different applications and opportunities for hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, which hopefully will set us up nicely for this discussion. Uh, Curtis, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. So the opportunity for the UK, I think uh, we're going to get onto this more in the panel, but I thought it was important to start framing this a little bit from the outset. So as the Hydrogen Council noted in their first report in 2017, hydrogen is an enormous global opportunity in the energy transition. Uh, by many estimates, it could be as much as 20% of total final energy consumption by 2050. And we at the UK HFCA firmly believe that the UK should be a leader in this area. Not only was the UK the first area to pioneer the fuel cell through William Grove, but also Henry Cavendish was the first individual to discover hydrogen. And given a number of our leading companies, not just UK HFCA members, but other members of companies all across the UK, we think there's an enormous opportunity to be captured here for policymakers, investors, and for businesses. There is now a robust and growing body of evidence to suggest that hydrogen production in the UK could provide between 20 to 50 percent of all final energy consumed in the UK by 2050. And this is a significant number. To give you some idea of scale, the global re sorry, the UK retail energy spend as of 2019 was 150 billion pounds across electricity, gas, and all transportation. So and by estimates at the moment, we at the Pro team have calculated that that means the hydrogen market in the UK could be worth between 80 billion and 240 billion in the UK alone by 2050. So a huge opportunity here. Um, there are also a number of groups across the UK uh, led by a group called the Hydrogen Strategy Now campaign, who UK HFCA have been proud to support, who have committed to investing one and a half billion into hydrogen projects across the UK as and when there is a robust government strategy in place from the UK government, which we are hopeful and optimistic will be announced shortly. 
And that opportunity goes beyond raw investment, it also goes into jobs. Um, and uh, the FCA, JU, has published a report saying up to 46,000 jobs can be created in the UK by 2030. And other groups like the Hydrogen Task Force have also done a great job in talking about the potential and saying that potentially 74,000 jobs can be created by 2035 in the UK, adding 18 billion of gross value added to the British economy. So an enormous opportunity for hydrogen in the UK and an enormous export opportunity as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please, Curtis. So what are we trying to do about this? How are we trying to take this enormous opportunity as the UK HFCA and make this a practical reality? Well, one thing we're trying to do is increase the exposure of our members' activities and what they can provide to customers looking to get to net zero. Um, and we're trying to make that more aware and accessible. So this particular webinar is one of such a, one of several events we will be looking to do more of in the future. Uh, on the 5th of November, there will be a showcase that we will run from UK HFCA members that will demonstrate some of their systems and solutions and what they can do. So we invite you, if you enjoy this webinar, that you can come and join at that event on the 5th of November and learn a little bit more about what our members have to offer. We're also going to be more and more active on policy and talking to the government around what clear policy actions are needed at what different timeframes to ensure that the UK can use hydrogen to its full potential to decarbonize and meet the ambitious net zero 2050 goal we have, but also to make sure that we set a very realistic roadmap for that, how we see the policies evolving over time to give us the scaling we need, recognizing the timeline challenges that come with large-scale infrastructure. And as of this year, we've established subgroups in the UK HFCA to represent green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and fuel cells. And we will be looking to try and put out formal position papers on those three different areas by December this year. Um, or missing, maybe longer, but that's uh, the current expectation. Um, and finally, we're doing more to enhance coordination across different groups. And it's something that I'm sure you'll be aware of in this discussion uh, today from the other speakers, but you may also be aware of in your own general knowledge, is so many areas of the energy sector and the general transformation towards a zero carbon world, hydrogen touches on in one way or another. And the challenge of that amazing opportunity is coordination in many cases. And so the UK HFCA is trying to work a lot more with others to ensure we can coordinate our messaging, coordinate an understanding and clear set of objectives around what hydrogen can deliver and achieve. We're delighted to be working with so many organizations in the UK through a new group called the Hydrogen Coordination Forum. That represents around nine groups in the UK, including the Hydrogen Task Force, Scottish Hydrogen Association, Welsh Hydrogen Association, UK H2 Mobility, Midlands uh, Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Network, Hydrogen East and UK H2 Mobility, as well as the BCGA and Renewable UK. So a great group of people and a really good attempt to make sure that we're coordinating better with the government and the UKHFCA plans to do more of that going forward. So with that, that is my overview of UKHFCA and activities. And in the two minutes I have before I hand over to Pierre Tien, um, I wanted to do a little bit of scene setting. So for those who may not be so familiar with the global hydrogen market, I want to give you a few high level facts to help to stir some of this discussion. So the global hydrogen market today is valued at $135 billion. This is primarily for hydrogen as an industrial gas. Around 70 million tons is commercially produced annually, requiring 6% of global natural gas and 2% of global coal. Indeed, the current methods of hydrogen production are extremely emission intensive. And part of the discussion today is talking about how we transform that and how we look at green and low emission hydrogen production and take that experience we have from the industrial gases sector and we apply that to the energy transition. We also need to look at numbers. Sometimes people get overwhelmed when they look at numbers, so it's important to put them in context. The Hydrogen Council made an announcement earlier this year in a great report talking about how $100 billion of investment by 2030 could deliver a cost decline of green hydrogen by up to 60% by 2030. Many individuals look at a number of $100 billion and assume that that is an enormous investment level. But put into the context of $1.2 to $1.6 trillion of annual energy investment globally that is already occurring, or put into context against the $300 billion that is annually invested in solar and wind. This is a very manageable and deliverable objective in terms of investment. And it's important that we don't lose sight of that when we're thinking about these wider sector transitions. Finally, I wanted to give people a sense of perspective on time. Time is a very difficult thing for people to understand in the context of an energy transition, but it is essential. In the 1970s, the gas network in the UK provided only 5% of all primary energy to the country. Today, that number is well north of 20%. If you also look at cars, in 1980, there were 14.6 million passenger vehicles in the UK. Today, 40 years later, there are 31 million and half a million heavy good vehicles that are there. But 
positively, we have been able to see enormous change. So from a town gas grid that was 50% hydrogen in the 1970s, within a decade, we were able to transition over 40 million gas appliances to run on hydrogen within 10 years. So we know how to do these forms of transition. We have seen them happen before. We know the level of investment needed, and it is well within the reach of investors and businesses and policymakers to do so. The question is, will they, and how can they do that to ensure that those opportunities for a green recovery and a post-COVID economic recovery can be captured? I'm delighted now to hand over to Pierre Tien who is the Secretary of the Hydrogen Council, to give us a 10-minute presentation on that topic before we move into a Q&A. Pierre Tien, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be to be with you today and to speak about the, this huge potential of hydrogen. And it's very interesting because you, you've taken a, basically a decade-long background into your, your views, and I'm going to be very short-term minded. I'm going to take only a few years back. And if you take a few years back, the situation of the hydrogen economy and the, the hopes that we had, basically towards 15, you barely started to see one or two um, FCEV models uh, in car uh, coming into the place. Uh, you had still a couple of bus, almost no trucks, uh, and you had a couple of people starting to imagine that it would be possible to pro probably take intermittent renewable energy and do some hydrogen with it using electrolysis as a potential node. If you take the situation five years from then, which is now, well, first we have, and it was not the case at the time, we have an international organization which is called the Hydrogen Council that we created late 16, early 17 in Davos. At the time, we were a little bit, to be very honest, we were a little bit worried because we thought people were only thinking about batteries as the only way to decarbonize transportation and not looking at the systemic view and that we needed a global systemic view of hydrogen role to make sure policymakers, NGOs, think tanks understand that we need to work both ways. We were 13 CEOs at the time joining at Davos. And now if you go to the next slide, um, the, the Hydrogen Council has, has made a, a, a significant progress and we have close to 100 members. In fact, I think now it's 92, but we have a couple that are ongoing and we have a large standing list. And those members, as you can see, are not only coming from the energy and automotive side, they're coming from the oil and gas, they're coming from the technology, they're coming from all continents. And we have now a couple of uh, investors that have joined a dedicated investor group we've created. That's another sign of the dynamic of the uh, vision for the sector that uh, occurred in the last uh, three years. Back to figures. Uh, between 2017 and now, we've published this study that you just mentioned, which has, I think, set the tone of the view for hydrogen by many other think tanks uh, on international organization. And now it's true that there's no report on the energy transition that does not acknowledge that hydrogen has a key role to play. So we've I think we've won that battle for the sector, which is that hydrogen is now widely recognized as a key part of the energy transition puzzle to be done. Second, we have been able to do so because we have also made a lot of progress in the technologies. And, and for those of you who are involved into that for years, you know that uh, even better than me. But we have probably close to 20,000 fuel cell cars up and running between California, Korea, Japan, China. China was nowhere three years ago, and now he's having more than 6,000 buses and trucks up and running. Korea, which had no plan four years ago, has now more than 100 stations up and running and more cars on the road than California, who used to be the pioneering country. California Executive Director just announced that by 2035, there would be no more ICE cars on the road in California, not just the city, the world California, which is a massive move. Uh, and on, on the upstream side, which is how to make sure hydrogen can be produced in a green way, in a clean way, you've got, I think, several gigawatts of power announced of power to gas project trying to value intermittent or low carbon energy sources into making hydrogen from electrolysis and on the other side many large carbon capture projects have been developed and some of them coming from uk who used to be 
uh, and is still a pioneering country around low carbon energy uh, solutions. So in the last five years, not only the vision, which uh, has been built as progressed, but also the demonstrations. And last, and that's the latest report we've commissioned with the Hydrogen Council uh, in January, we've also, next to the vision, told to ourselves, it's nice to say tomorrow hydrogen is going to be the new magic. 18% huh? of the energy demand, 20% uh, of the CO2 reduction. Cool, everything is fine by 1250, but no promise for 1230. We need to walk the talk. So the first way to walk the talk is to look seriously at the different applications that we have ahead of us on whether it, indeed hydrogen technologies have a chance to become cost competitive or to become, to become indeed the unavoidable solutions for decarbonizing a couple of processes. So we've done a, a very large cost roadmap uh, that we published in January uh, with McKinsey. Uh, we mapped out around uh, 30 applications which cover 60% of the world emissions, mostly in transport, on industry and stationary applications, to look whether they had a chance to become competitive in the decade. And the result is that indeed almost half of them will become not only competitive with the uh, other alternative solutions, but also in some cases even competitive with the fossil-based energy, because the cost of those is going to increase thanks to thanks to or because of the co2 uh, penalty attached to it and now the result of that uh, uh, roadmap is that indeed as you said hydrogen value chain is the hydrogen production it's the distribution and it's the component of the end users especially in the transport industry it's the fuel cell and the reservoirs and the cars the cars cost basically the hydrogen production could move from gray to green but the green part, which is today done by electrolysis costing around six euros or six dollars per kilo, could be reduced by up to three times, between two and three euros, which is a massive shift. Second, the distribution part of it, which is the downstream value chain, if you look at transportation sectors, could reduce by 70%, just because you're going to increase the size, the scale, and the load of the stations that you're going to use. And third, the cost of the components to develop the massive heavy duty buses, trucks, low, uh, light commercial vehicle, light duty vehicles, and so on, all the efforts done by the whole OEM industry is going also to reduce by 60%. But only that because of scale. So the big topic now for the decade is to reach scale on the fastest, the better. The fastest means that we need to find the proper policies with the different nations uh, and the key, the key players to indeed accompany the industry into making large projects which enable scale to bring cost benefits. And what has happened, and I will finish there so that we can move into the discussion, what has happened over the, I would say, the last couple of years, we've seen a significant shift in the policymakers' engagement towards hydrogen. It, has, it started long ago in California, and it's still moving. Europe had a very strong, I would see, R&D push, with uh, Germany being a very pioneering country trying to move the deployment at scale of a couple of applications. But so far, it was more demonstration-driven, with, with also a big focus from UK. And uh, Asian countries were relatively... I would say quiet, except Japan. Now, Japan, Korea, China have put have poured mass, massive subsidies and support to the industry to develop the downstream use. Europe, as we've seen during the COVID recovery plans, has taken a massive, I would say, shift toward hydrogen being one of the pillars of the energy transition. We'll come to that in a minute. And the only place, in fact, which is now lagging as a federal view is the US, because California continues. But basically, we are now in a situation where most of the key, I would say, mature, advanced countries having, I would say, technology champions on the matter have embarked into the cause. So it's now up to us and them together to find the right schemes on regulation to make this decade happen. And I believe it's feasible. We'll have a couple of priorities, but maybe we will discuss them uh, in a minute, I would like to get to the last slide that I wanted to show with you. 
it's indeed now that we need to do that uh, for several, for three reasons. First, I think when we had our council internal discussions, and Sam was part of the council with me, can can testimony maybe later in the Q and A, um, in the panel, that we said to ourselves the worst that could happen is that the COVID leads to recovery plans without anything on energy transition or anything on hydrogen. And the result is that we 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 mobilized forces and Hydrogen Europe organization and others did the same. And we are, I think, in a very good position following this COVID period, which is not over, but it's hopefully it will be over soon, um, with significant plans for hydrogen. So that's the right moment. It's a reset time. People have, have understood we need to shift. And so hydrogen is a key part of it. Second, it's only when you look into large industrial investments or automotive investments, you know that you're investing for 20 years. So if we miss the new investment cycle now, we are locked in for another 20 years. So we need to shift now. We need to make sure the new green food projects, the new uh, fossil-based projects have the right carbon capture technologies and that the new plans, long-term plans for OEM technology development are based using fuel cell as part of the different options. And third, if we don't move now, we are going to have CO2 locked in investments in the system. And we cannot do that because it's going to have an impact on the balance sheets of all the key companies because we know that in the decades that come, the regulation are going to be more stringent uh, towards uh, low carbon solutions. So hydrogen is the right moment at the right place. We just need to make it right, looking at safety, at cost, and making sure it's clean. But that's maybe for the next uh, discussion. Thank you. Fantastic, and thank you very much, Pietien, for um, for going through that. Um, Curtis, maybe if you tip slide down so that uh, the screen's a little bit bigger, we can put it back up. Fantastic, thank you. Just so that our listeners can see us a little bit better. Um, so, Pietien, thank you for your comments. Um, I guess one of the things that I wanted to ask a little bit here was, um, I think we have to be a little bit topical on this one. Um, you talked about Europe, and you mentioned how uh, there's been a bit of a sea change here. Do you feel that um, the great reset that you were just discussing on your final slide and that COVID could be that opportunity to really invest in that green recovery and to try and avoid that CO2 lock-in uh, has fed directly into these announcements about hydrogen strategies from France and from Germany? And what do you think the significance of Europe having these large hydrogen strategies will be on countries like the US, on the UK, and indeed actually other markets that we often don't talk about, but are arguably even more important, like India, Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria, and many of these emerging markets. Well, I think what, what, what Europe is announcing, which is a systemic ambition to both decarbonize massively hydrogen production and also to develop its use in the different key industry verticals with a request to localize as much as possible the technologies and with pouring such amounts of money is going to have a significant impact on the way industry is going to look where it localizes its assets and where it develops the first projects. And so I would be very surprised that this doesn't change the rest of the world. What's new also in Europe is that it's not only Europe from the northern part, which are the Netherlands and Germany, which were usual suspects supporting the technology, Al along with UK, by the way, before you left, but, but maybe you will still be in on that topic. Um, but also the Nordics, I think the Nordics were very advanced. Now you see France, and it's my country, so I've been preaching in France for the last 10 years, trying to make France adhere to the plan, and now France is in. And that changes the dynamic because, of course, France is a key country in Europe and jointly with Germany, plus the northern parts, plus Italy and Spain, you've got really the bulk of it now pushing. So that's fundamental. And I think it's going to trigger reactions because we're moving into a technology play. I think if you look at the big technologies of the next decades, batteries is already almost almost a lost battle for the ones who want to cooperate because the Chinese have taken a very ch big chunk of it. But when you come to fuel cell, to uh, new technologies around alkaline or PEM or whatever on electrolysis, if you take about carbon capture, if you take about the low the composite uh, the composite reservoir type four, type five and so on, this is an open game. And so if the other countries do not react, they're going to see the technology fly away. So I would be surprised that 
post the election time in the US, we don't see some kind of a gathering of a bigger ambition in the US as a state and not just uh, spots of, a, I would say, individual uh, federal st um, local state initiatives, even if California is fundamental. And I would be also surprised not to see a rebound of the Japanese ambition. Japan has never stopped, but Japan has never has not accelerated since. But Korea has accelerated significantly. China is going to accelerate because they have a plan for the downstream, but not for the upstream. And I would be surprised Japan does not move at, as well now. So it should trigger a massive dynamic. And you mentioned that um, I think your, the quote I had from you earlier was, we've won the battle for the sector. And hydrogen is now part of their strategies, and we need to walk the walk, uh, you know, and we need to actually make some investments. And obviously, the Hydrogen Council has a number of large industry organizations that have invested a lot of money. Uh, a lot of governments have now announced that they're going to invest some money. Do you think investors are ready to walk the walk? And do you think that the investor community is ready to support the ambitions of the hydrogen sector? And what are maybe the barriers that are still holding back uh, that huge capability and all of that spare capital? Uh, I think last time I checked, it's still $15 trillion in negative yielding bonds held by investors. So how do we unlock that and get that to sort of help accelerate and facilitate this transition? I think this is precisely the next big step that we need to, to reach. And for that, this is where you need the policymakers and the regulation to show that the dynamic into production, production of hydrogen is unavoidable and is uh, and will be uh, uh, irresistible. Uh, and that requires really a mix of the regulation, like take RED2 regulation, which is imposing a change in the biofuel quotas of the downstream uh, use of fuels in transportation system, that is enabling refiners to substitute biofuel quotas downstream by the use of green hydrogen. That RED2 regulation, um, when it's going to be applied, generates a big appetite for green hydrogen and could be a good triggering factor for large investors, uh, large investments sorry, in power to gas with a real of tech potential, which is then making some projects bankable, I would say. Second, I think the regulations on the captive fleets deployments, which are pushing a strong, very stringent uh, emission standards for trucks, large heavy logistics applications, are going to push the OEMs to move into heavy duty trucks using hydrogen. Here, if you have those regulations coupled with the right subsidy mechanisms, contract for difference, PPPs, then you will generate the need for large investments and I think investors, financial investors will be moving in. You know, for the financial investors, this is the next solar wave, in fact, what's coming. We just need to make sure it is irresistible so that they invest with a view for taking uh, a very good terminal value position in their investments and to find the right, uh, indeed, support schemes uh, so that part of the of the cost that we need to uh, to fight or to decrease in the coming decade is, is helped by the policy support. And of course, perhaps the most important bit we haven't really talked about is end users. So, you know, it, we have we have a lot of industry that is aligned on the opportunity. We have a number of policymakers that are taking action. There are some investors, and you've obviously listed a number, and there are a number of PPHFCA members that are also investors. How, how do we help to get end customers comfortable with the technology? You know, I mean, in some senses, we're quite fond, I think, of saying that there's nothing new to hydrogen. It's an old industry. You, you sort of made a reference to how earlier I was talking about decades. But I think it's often that sense when we talk to people and talk to customers that it feels like it's new, even though it's, it's not. So how do you see that next step? And I say end customers in two categories. Individuals who are maybe looking at hydrogen and how it affects their daily lives, and then also businesses and how it actually affects their business operations. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you see that and crucially whether you see that there's actually a difference in different markets. And, and I asked that because uh, recently my colleagues were speaking to Sarah's Power um, on the podcast that I do, and they mentioned that uh, if you go to Japan and you ask about fuel cells, 90% of people can tell you where to buy a fuel cell. There are adverts of people singing about the merits of fuel cells on Japanese TV. But if you go to London, maybe 20% of people have heard of a fuel cell, and almost none of them can tell you where to buy one. So, you know, is that the similar disparity you see with your global energy castle hat, and how do we get around that? 
Well, I think what's new with hydrogen is now it works. Uh, because before it was before it was a promise, it was a couple of demonstration. But it was not steadily working over long periods of time for really large series of of, of units of cars, of trucks, so and that's coming. So that's new. It's not enough because it's still several tens of thousands. So it's not comparable to the battery. But we are moving to that stage. So we need to communicate more on that. And this is, by the way, one of the things that the Council is going to do in the future is to make a lot of a global advocacy campaign and push the industry leaders to indeed better advocate the beauties and the magic of hydrogen for the end users. And when we speak about end users, of course, it's mostly the car industry. And we know that the, the, the distinctive advantage of hydrogen cars, the autonomy, the time to refuel with the benefits of an electric car are there. They're even comforted in any new models coming. So I think it's a question of making it known. Known, sorry. Then for the business players, for the industry, I think we are moving into um, two different types of topics. You've got industry players which use hydrogen daily and that need progressively to decarbonize that. This is the job that we have to do as industrial gas players. I'm taking my air kit at one second. We need to progressively offer decarbonized hydrogen. And it has a cost. And it has a cost which is basically the result of the value of a low carbon solution. The question is, and that's a fundamental one, are we collectively ready as a society to bear, to bear that extra cost? And so if there is a society consensus, then I think our customers are going to be willing to take the extra cost because they know that they can pass it on to the final end user and the final end user is going to accept it because in its overall product cost, the energy part is not so significant. So we need to make sure this value of low carbon is widely understood. That's for the customers that have to shift from gray to blue or clean hydrogen. Then they've got the other ones which are using classical fossil fuels, like the steel industry, and now they know that they need to shift. And they know that one way to shift is to use either synthesis gases or to use direct reduced iron using hydrogen. And that has, a, that has an extra cost as well. And there it's not a question of, I would say, technology, because we know how to do it. You need to do a couple of scale-up studies, but it's a question of global geopolitics and policies is how do you protect your local industries by helping those industrial players to be the early adopters of those new technologies which are clean? How do you protect them against other countries which are not doing the same? So here we are back into politics. I think if we are serious about the energy transition, we need to help those customers to pay or afford that delta cost and then it's going to work because technology is really getting ready. Yeah, Tian, thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Bryony Thomas, who is going to be chairing the panel discussion now, and I invite uh, Pierre Tian and our other speakers to uh, introduce themselves after Bryony has done her introduction. So, thank you, Pierre Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Pierre. That's That's been a really interesting start to this session, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today to chair the panel session with a group of speakers who are going to introduce themselves in a moment. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I head the transport team at Burgess Salmon, which is an independent UK law firm which uh, specialises and works in a range of areas and has particular interest in the net zero agenda and works with a lot of clients. A lot of the people who are attending the webinar today have worked with us in the past on various energy projects. From my perspective, transport is very much my bag, and I know it's been mentioned many times by people people today as it's, it's hopefully going to end up being a key end user of the solutions that we're looking at. Um, but I'll just invite each of the panelists now to introduce themselves. So Elizabeth, maybe maybe you'd like to introduce yourself first. Hi, thanks, Bryony. Yeah, I'm I'm Elizabeth Scarif. I, I head up corporate communications at Sarah's Power. We're a UK-based fuel cell company licensing our technology globally. Personally, I spent uh, more than 10 years working in the oil and gas industry, so I've made the transition into clean energy and you know fascinated by that um, overall energy transition and 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 how we go from being very fossil fuel dependent and 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 the role that hydrogen has to play in that future energy system 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Mark? Good, uh, th th thanks, Bryony. So I'm uh, Mark Freed. I'm head of uh, Mark Development at Anglo American. And for, uh, for Anglo, we, we see hydrogen from, from two angles. Um, for many years, for, for more than a decade, we've been a supporter of uh, the sector as a whole uh, because we believe it's a, it's a great future market for some of the metals that we mine, particularly uh, platinum um, and some of the others. But also, um, more recently, for the last uh, two years or so about, uh, also, you know, hydrogen as a key component potentially to uh, decarbonize our own operations. Um, and so, you know, we're a big user, of course, of uh, diesel and fossil fuels in our, in our own operations. And hydrogen is one of the solutions that can help decarbonize it. So we, we, we approach it from two angles, both as a user, but also almost as a technology push play uh, from the market development side. Thank you, Mark. Sam, our final panelist, would you, would you like to introduce yourself now? Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Sam French. Uh, I work in business development at Johnson Matthey. Um, Johnson Matthey, UK-based company, over 200 years old, um, and a global company. I think one of the key elements that's maybe not well understood is that we actually um, cover all of the different areas of the hydrogen value chain. So we're very inter interested in technologies for large-scale blue hydrogen production, and we can talk about some of the projects we're involved in later, uh, as well as potential component supply for green hydrogen. We're looking at the ways you can transport hydrogen by things like ammonia. Um, we also have a fuel cell business making key components based here in the UK, um, a large manufacturing, state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Swindon, as well as now expanding into the market Pierre Tian mentioned out into China. We're also involved in many of the petrochemical processes providing both catalyst and technology, which again, as has been mentioned, we'll need to decarbonize as we move forward. Thank you, Sam, and, and thank you to, to everyone. So I think that what I'd like to do is, is sort of open up the discussion really to build on some of the topics that Pierre and Chris have already uh, spoken about, but also to perhaps invite some thoughts on the impact that COVID is having or, or has the potential to have on the transition to net zero. I know that on, on several occasions already this afternoon, people have mentioned the importance of politics and policy initiatives to help drive forward change and support investment in change. Um, and I wonder whether the panellists have any views on whether they think that the current situation and the reaction to the pandemic might actually prompt an acceleration in the decarbonisation agenda and help, help facilitate change and uh, how the policymakers might be able to support that. So, uh, Elizabeth, would, would you like to go first with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in my role, I'm very focused on the day-to-day -day with our investor base, so very interested in the comments that Pierre had made around that. Um, you know, and I think six months ago, there was a risk that maybe COVID-19 might push aside the kind of climate emergency, not least because the fossil fuel energy was becoming cheaper than ever. But actually what we've seen I think is a real increased commitment to green initiatives by many governments and in a way it's been the perfect storm, the perfect backdrop in terms of government, um, you know, public opinion, corporates having an existential threat to their, their existing businesses um, and you know, I think that's driving um, the climate's uh, urgency for change at an even greater pace and with interest rates at an all-time low, you know, if we're going to put our money to work in the economy, we might as well be doing that in a way that delivers a positive change for the environment. And you've seen it with the likes of, you know, the EU funding packages that have been announced. It's not only kind of 550 billion euros towards green projects, but it's, it's also sort of stating that the wider EU budget must do no harm, um, you know, in its goal to become carbon uh, neutral by 2050. So I think there's a, a real trend in this direction across all stakeholders. Excellent. And Sam, I know that prior to uh, the, the pandemic hitting, 
uh, Johnson Mapping was having success and, and there were lots of projects that are starting on the way. Is, is there a feeling that that pipeline is, is going to open up and improve as a result of, of these policy shifts and the investment that's coming and, and what opportunities are you seeing to actually get, get these solutions to, to the market and the end users? Um, I think we're seeing more and more interest globally. Um, focusing on the UK, yes, we do have um, some world-leading projects in the pipeline that have been well supported to date by government. The key next step which will unlock these projects are actually getting to financial investment decision will be the creation of business models. That's been alluded to by uh, both Chris and Pierre Tien. We're seeing some of these large European strategies have come out, which yes, they're very positive, but haven't got the detail on them. I think there are UK pro projects which are still in advance of any elsewhere, but we need those key business models to attract in that private investment that Pierre Tien was talking about. And we see that these really have an opportunity from a government perspective to allow investment in jobs and skills at a time when the economy is absolutely demanding or needs that, and also for those investments to be in areas of the country that really do require investment. So I think it is, again, it's a very positive position, but we now need those uh, business models in place. And as you, as you identified, that was echoing some of the comments that, that Pierre was making about um, how to really open up the investment models. And Pierre, I'm interested, if, are there things that need to come from policymakers to help support that? Or are there things that the industry itself can do to help um, put the projects in a, a, a more bankable format for, for investors? So, so I think the, the, role, the role we have as industry players, and I'm speaking as a liquid, is of course to walk the talk by delivering cheaper and cheaper uh, capex in our equipment so that hydrogen becomes cost competitive, the, especially the green and the blue one, with the, the grey hydrogen. Uh, we need also, as industry, to find the right ecosystems of players ready to develop the use of the technology, uh, uh, users of large fleets of trucks or taxis or uh, uh, or buses uh, and, and get, I, I would say, the conditions of the deal ready and define what's needed in terms of policy support to make it bankable. And then, based on that, we can go and see the governments and ask them to themselves work the talk because everybody has announced a lot of money and now we need to find the way it's going to work. So we're speaking a lot typically on contract for difference for the, I would say, green production of hydrogen. If we're capable to find the right of takers at a certain given price, which is acceptable, if the delta can be supported in a certain period of time by governments under clear conditions, then I think you've got something that is bankable. And the downstream side, if you can have a kind of a, a PPP agreement with a dedicated government or set the government saying we're going to help set up a retail distribution network in a certain number of big logistic corridors and we pay some of the fixed costs related to make sure it works and then the industrial players are going to supply the hydrogen as others and then you've got uh, OEMs putting cars on the road then you've got the conditions to make something which becomes bankable so it's a free party job it's very new it's unusual but it's the only way to move from a system to another that's, that's really interesting observations and i, I like like your commentary about how we have to create the right ecosystem for all of it to work. Mark, I know that Anglo-American uh, looks at, at hydrogen sort of from different angles because it uh, clearly puts significant um, investments into its aggregated freight corridor and, and truck solutions, but also it uh, has an arm that's offering investment, seed investment, angel investments to um, other projects as well. So I'd be interested with your views on how all of this aligns and also the types of investment, whether we should be focusing at the, the smaller projects, medium, large, or whether we need to look at all in order to create the right environments for the technology um, to get to market in the most uh, efficient and, and, and quickest way possible. Great, thanks. 
on the um, yeah, so we spoke about the two angles, right? The the use case side, and and then also where we where we apply a sort of technology push approach, and and we do invest uh, right along uh, the value chain. If you ask me, you know, where should we be investing in the small projects, medium projects, or big projects? I I fully align with everyone else here, right? It's scale, 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 um, and it's finding those. Uh, Pierre talks about the ecosystem of players that you need to put together. Um, and much of our work is also about how do you pull those, who are those parties, what are the projects, and how do you get them around the table. Um, when we talk about freight corridors, um, there has to be an aligned user group uh, and an aligned uh, supply group. Right? All the technologies need to come together to meet that. I do think, however, that there is still investment, of course, needed in in not necessarily small projects, but in technology. So there are, in addition to the scale-up, um, in addition to the cost down that you're going to get from scale-up, there are still uh, technology improvements that can be had. And so investments in those, improving those technologies and scaling specific technologies also help bring down uh, the total cost. So I don't think it's an, it's, it's an either-or. I, I think it all, again, uh, works together. Um, just also picking up a little bit of what Pierre and Sam uh, were saying earlier, Pierre was mentioning this, this contracts for difference. Um, there's, a, there's this big, there's a little bit of a hill that we just have to get over. It's not forever, right? And, and you just need that one push, and that's the policy push and the subsidy push that I think you need, because there's a first mover disadvantage here. Uh, as soon as you're over the hill and the costs are down, uh, the projects are bankable. Uh, and but it's just not now, and that's where the subsidy needs to uh, needs to come in. And do you think that the UK needs to be looking at things that it should be doing? Clearly, we've seen some big announcements by the European Union um, and investment of, of billions of euros there. We know that in Germany, there's been very significant investment already. You know, if you were actually asking the UK policymakers what they can do to help prioritise um, investment in these projects and help, help ensure that the UK maintains it, its position at the, at the front of these technologies, what what would we be looking for them to do? Uh, Sam? So, uh, I think that what, what we need is a bit of learning by doing. Um, so, we need to be putting large-scale projects down. As I've mentioned earlier, there'll be some really good, um, thoughtful pro funding streams from UK government that have driven projects even to the point of being in front-end engineering design. We've got technology providers, both um, for blue and green hydrogen, which are uh, world-class, producing, uh, capable of producing at world scale. There is a piece here where we need to start matching uh, production and demand. That's often something that's talked about in hydrogen, a bit of a chicken and egg, which goes first. And then also, how do you build the underlying infrastructure? What we see as being um, a really positive starting point is the focus on these hard to abate sectors. So, so one of the sectors that UK government has focused on is industrial energy because that's a really hard to abate um, using electrification. So we know we're going to need to have uh, need hydrogen, clean hydrogen in that uh, sector. And the other thing with that is it drives large scale. So we what we're now looking at is how we deploy some of these initial projects, likely at industrial clusters, which will then have a large demand. When you put that sort of scale of production down, there will be spillover into other sectors, so into transport. This isn't a blue versus green argument either. We need both of them. There are a lot of synergies between blue and green hydrogen. What we must make sure is that if we're building business models and contract for difference has been mentioned and for hydrogen production, we think that is a very good model, that there's a twin track approach that they're not competing against each other. We're going to need both of them. Green is the longer term um, solution that we need, but the price is higher. So you can't have them competing. They can be under the same type of model, 
but they, we need to have a twin track approach to support and develop both. Particularly for green hydrogen, the cost will come down by scaling up production and with the cost down and renewable electricity that everyone envisages. And it's, it's interesting that you talk about the cost and the challenges between uh, green and blue hydrogen and ultimately who is going to pay for this. What, what we're looking for is for policymakers, I've heard the word subsidy used a, a few times, and ultimately that means that taxpayers will be paying. I, I just wonder, Elizabeth, it, do we think that the message is getting out properly to the public ultimately who are going to be helping fund and pay for some of this, that they understand the debate that's being had and that they will be ready to embrace the change that is needed, both in terms of the funding that will need to be made available for hydrogen at a point when public sector funding is going to be very constrained, but also perhaps in some, some of the large infrastructure projects that may have to happen on their doorstep to, to implement some of these changes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been touched on already. I think the UK is perhaps a little bit behind the curve in terms of making hydrogen understood in the mainstream. And, you know, as, as has been touched on in Japan, you see advertisements on TV for fuel cell technologies. In Korea, you know, car companies are using boy bands to champion and popularize hydrogen vehicles. And um, the Hydrogen Council, I was just having a chat the other day with a subcommittee of the Hydrogen Council on the Climate Champion campaign that they're now launching around, um, you know, raising citizens' awareness of hydrogen and how it, how it plays. So I think there is more work to be done in terms of getting the general public behind the role that hydrogen can play. And, you know, we've, we've, we've touched on it already, but if, if the ambition was 80% decarbonisation, we might get there with electrification. That's not going to be the case if we are aiming for carbon neutral, and it is really important that we touch on some of these harder to carbonize areas of society. You know, it's hard to see how we maintain our standard of living without addressing agrochem or you know pharmaceuticals or even the the sort of um, uh, beauty industry. And so I think there is a lack of awareness around that, and you know we. That the, the headlines are around hydrogen for transport and power and, and heat, and those are important. But it's it it is a huge challenge, and I think we need to lay it out. And I think the public will respond to that if it's um, done with the right messages. Thank you. It, it's interesting because for me, I come with very much a, a transport-based skew on this um, but i do know that in, in the transport industry the press tends to be um, very enthusiastic about um, developing technologies uh, but there's still a hesitancy always about implementing them and i think that that is one of the challenges that is always there for new technologies is both getting over the public perceptions um, and also the investor perceptions i think Mark, it would be interesting to understand where where we think perhaps the easiest entry points might be to get people over these hurdles to understand that hydrogen is here, it's, it is a fuel, and we should be expecting to be using it going forward. Where do we think that the quick wins are to get the public on board with this so that they understand the need for investment in it? No, it's an interesting and a, and a tough question. If you ask me where's, where's the quick ones, uh, I would say the quick ones are exactly in those applications which hydrogen is, is best suited to. So um, also, and those which are most visible. So again, transport is an interesting one. Uh, buses, trucks, those are, are highly visible. It's also clear that hydrogen has a clear advantage in, in those applications. Um, so that's where I would uh, suggest that's um, a clear focus, which are both uh, publicly available uh, or publicly, um, you know, it's a highlight, everyone can see it, uh, and hydrogen has a clear advantage of everything else. They are the industrial applications of where hydrogen has real advantages, and even in our own operations, uh, for example, with mining trucks, um, those are not clearly, you know, there's not a huge public um, uh, operations where everyone can ha come and have a look. But those are applications uh, where today, for example, in our mining operations, we think we can make uh, the economic case uh, for displacing diesel uh, with hydrogen-powered trucks. Uh, 
Um, so that and us communicating that publicly will also show uh, show it to the public that it can actually be, be done. Thank you. And Pierre, I mean, you, you um, talked a lot about how we create this right ecosystem. If, if we manage to get greater public awareness, we manage to get the policy environment right, are we then looking at really it is about the money or are there other barriers that are impeding things at the moment? Are we being too simplistic and thinking it is just about funding? Oh, Pierre, I think you're mute. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's true. It's true that the, the the money is always playing a role. But 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 if we go back to the fundamentals, you need to create the demand and the appetite. This is what we tried to do when we created this um, uh, this taxi fleet in Paris, supporting a startup developing that and giving giving it some scale and showing that the case is self sustainable. That is creating at least the end user experience, which is fundamental. But when people have tried and have used a fuel cell car or a fuel cell system, they understand the value, and then they look a little bit less, but they look at the cost, but less, not exactly the same way. So we need to create those cases, which makes it, I would say, um, as competitive as possible and, and uh, which for which the value is uh, making people ready to pay for it. Second, we did not touch on it, but we need, of course, to walk the talk also in safety. We need to make sure that there's not going to be any major issue with safety because hydrogen is a new molecule for the grand public, for the public opinion, for the consumer. And so it's not more or less dangerous than other energies, but we need to make sure we deal with that properly. And that's a topic because more and more players are going to use it to deploy equipments, so we need to be very careful with that. And uh, then, if you've got the, if people are comfortable, they, they, they feel they can use properly, safely, reliably the technology, then they will speak about the cost. And when we move about the cost, then we'll have a debate. And yes, you're going in the end probably to pay a little bit higher your cost for your car or for your fuel. But it's going to be an adjustment with all the type of budgets, and you're going basically to pay for a safer planet in the end and for safer conditions for your own environment. And you will just have to reallocate a little bit of your budget funding, and this is where the state will play a game by maybe, maybe putting in place the CO2 taxes and so on. So the money comes in the end, but only when you've solved the rest is to make sure people want to take it. And I think we are close to that. And then we'll find we'll find the solutions for the money. We always do. <laughs> Excellent. So so if we can get the, the hearts of the public on board with it, then then we can move forward. And I think that, that sort of links to a question I'd like to put to you, Sam. If if we're going to get the public on board and believe in investing that, realistically what timelines are we looking at? We've got a net zero ambition that is, well, actually a commitment in the UK that is only 30 years away. I work in a sector where 30 years to deliver infrastructure goes very quickly. <laughs> um, you know, how, how quickly will the public actually start to see output? Or could we get some of these things to market in a way? Um, and more than maybe a small fleet of hydrogen buses in, in Aberdeen? Yeah, well, I think it's a really good Point, and it comes back to one of Pierre Tien's slides where we talk about locking in large-scale investments. What we do now at large scale will likely be on the ground 2040 to 2050 timeline. So now is the time for change. Um, the types of projects we're talking about could be on the ground uh, producing um, gigawatts of hydrogen by 20, late 2020s. So this is the this is the decade where we really need to be doing things that we will learn and understand what really needs to happen at a large scale during the 2030s. So we need to be doing big projects now, not demonstrators or pilot plants. They need to be big projects. And then from that, we will work out how to do that at a multiple of 10 during the 2030s. So it's imminent. I think there is an important question about which sectors you're focusing on and how 
much they play to the uh, how engaged the public are. For transport, we'll need a, a system of hydrogen refueling stations. There are a few of those. We're, re, you know, we're quite far behind in the UK in terms of numbers versus some other European countries, but that's uh, surmountable. I think the larger projects in, to industry, one thing we haven't talked about so far is blending hydrogen into natural gas. Um, people have different opinions on that. A decarbonised route to heating is going to be vital for the UK if we're going to hit net zero. Blending 20% by volume of hydrogen isn't going to get you to net zero, but it does start to bring hydrogen into more into the public perception and also really is a good way to grow your production volumes. So I think there are a number of elements in different sectors. Back to who's going to play, pay, this is a bit carrot and stick. So at the moment, the stick, which is ultimately carbon price, just isn't big enough. We can't make that stick much larger too quickly, otherwise essentially we'll close down our industrial base. They all are producing products, they're selling into a commodity, global commodity marketplace. So we do need to have that balance. So what we need is these short-term subsidy programs that allows us to overcome the differential between today's dirty energy source and tomorrow's clean energy source. So I think we can move quickly. We know that there are projects that can get to FID in the next couple of years and could be constructed two, three years after that. That's both you know, really large green hydrogen projects and also large blue hydrogen projects. After that, we can find the, we can do the, the changes required within certain sectors to allow the use of that hydrogen. So it is, it's imminent. We're ready. We're on the starting line. We, we you know, we really just need to, to be getting on with it and doing it. Thank you, Sam. That was that was a, a great, great summation of, of uh, many of the issues that we've covered today. And I'm conscious that, that time is actually racking by and we've had quite a lot of questions asked. So I just invite each of the panelists, perhaps if, if they have a, a, a particular uh, thought or uh, that they would like to leave people with or a change that they would like people to think about that might, might assist in, in the decarbonisation agenda and promotion of, of hydrogen, that that would be interesting. So, Elizabeth, is there, is there something you would like to leave leave people with before we move to the Q and A session? Um, yeah, just picking up on a point actually that Sam made. We haven't really touched too much on the kind of role of hydrogen in heating, and uh, and I do think that that's something that um, has the potential to have very big impacts and be very visible on the public agenda, and is a big big challenge for government. Um, and I. You know, I believe that um, government is perhaps very focused in the UK on generating supply without perhaps giving enough thought on the demand side. And I think there does need to be uh, more thought put into our hydrogen strategy in the UK around where the demand is and what the end uses are. And I think um, heating as uh, CHP through through fuel cell applications is a, is a, is a core pillar of that and the use of hydrogen blending it into the gas grid we have a gas grid in this country that's going to be good for another 75 years that goes well beyond the 2050 target and we should be utilizing that so that would be my observation fantastic it sounds as a whole webinar in its own rights to be honest uh, mark would you, would you like to share any thoughts yeah i think to me three 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 main things and um, they've all, all already been said in, in various forms. The first is um, that hydrogen should not be seen uh, as a competitor to, to other technologies. Um, you know, the case in transport always being uh, two batteries. It, it's complementary um, and, and we need it all. Um, the second piece, and this, you know, we, we said heat, we spoke of industrial, we spoke about transport, is that Clear recognition that you know hydrogen, the, this, this cross-sectoral integration is uh, is a unique strength uh, that uh, that hydrogen has. And then the third thing, uh, being the time is now. Uh, I absolutely agree. The technology is ready. Um, there are applications and uh, investments must happen now. 
uh, for us to to achieve any other targets that even, even our own companies, our own operations are setting. We can't hit our 2030 decarbonization targets if we're not uh, making those investments today. Thank you, Mark. So the time is now, Pierre Etienne. We've heard that from, from Sam and Mark. I'm, I'm sure <laughs> Elizabeth uh, would, would agree too. Uh, I assume that, that you would also be advocating that as one of the messages you want, want people to take away. Yes, and maybe very, very fast. Uh, one small uh, hint at the uh, UK. I think we're just waiting for UK to push its own agenda as well so that we have a complete pan-European, I don't know how you call it now, but uh, a real Europe-wide uh, push for hydrogen. I think UK is a fundamental country in this European continent, and so we expect you to push forward your own uh, policies as well because you, you started many pioneering projects like the Leeds or the H21, uh, uh, which are very big ones, and I think they need to move to the next step. So we're looking forward for that. Fantastic. And Sam, the final word before we pass the pipe to Chris, who's going to uh, chair the, the Q&A session and, and deal with some of these interesting questions that have come flooding in. Mm. Uh, I echo what the other panellists have said. It's now. I think I've got a request for government, which is the business models, to let us get on with doing things as quickly as possible. I think for the community, it's to stop arguing about green versus blue versus electrification. It's all of it. We need all of it. And the other one for the community is for us to engage the consumers and the, the, the wider population. Um, it's briefly mentioned about the Climate Champion campaign, through, um, which has been kicked off by the Hygiene Council. Please engage with that. Please share that as widely as possible, because without that, we're only going to get so far. Thank you very much, Sam. Chris, over to you for the session. Right, thank you very much for running that excellent panel. Um, as you'll see, there are an army of questions here. Um, so to try and get through as many as I can, the panelists are going to hate me. I'm going to constrain your answers to a minute and a half. So we're going to make this punchy. Um, I'm going to try and combine two questions to start with. So Harsh Prashad asked the question, what would it take for the UK to be a leader in hydrogen? So to have a 5 to 10 percent market share by 2025 or 2030. And Graham Cook's question is, do politicians actually have the courage in the UK to ask uh, end users to pay premium for that? And, and I guess the question here is, in the post-COVID recovery, there will be less money going around. And so money allocated to hydrogen is perhaps money that couldn't go elsewhere. So to maybe start with someone directly, let's go with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what would it take for the UK to be a leader in this? And do you think that there is actually appetite for the UK to make that level of investment at the moment? I think there is appetite. I think historically the UK has been very, very good at technology and engineering. It has you know, academic centres that rival any in the world and very, very good research. It's very good at building businesses from universities to sort of a certain level where we fall short is on scale and commercialization and it's been said time and time again by the panel scale is going to be the driver of, of cost down in this area so we need government to step up and what has been said again you know get us over that initial humps it's it there's a there's a first move a disadvantage in that up front the costs are going to be high we need scale and we need mass manufacture and we've lost out in batteries and solar and wind to Asia. So if we, you know, we have the political will and that's a game changer. Um, but if we don't have scale, then, you know, we're going to have to think laterally about where we derive value for the UK and that be it through, you know, supply chain, UK, you know, quota for UK content or, you know, at Saris, for example, we're um, licensing our technology globally. So we have the smarts, we have the technology, it's ready. It's, you know, it's how we generate scale and derive value. Great, and, and so maybe then uh, putting this on to Sam, I mean, Sam, I'm going to be a bit crueler and maybe ask you for some specifics. You know, there are some people on this call I know that are involved with government that will be, you know, listening with keen attention here. You know, in terms of sort of what would it take, you know, is this a case of having a CFD uh, that comes in? Is this a case of a, a sort of bought amount of, you know, money assigned to build 100 refueling stations? I mean, yeah, are there, as it were, almost like a shopping list of things in your head that you can see if we could actually get these out by 2025, it would make a meaningful difference? Um, yeah, well, a CFD model to get the production side going, and that's 
about our own internal production of hydrogen within the UK, but it's also the ability for us to scale our supply chain and importantly show the references of these projects, which de-risks it and then makes it <clears throat> an exportable technology. It's not just about, for us, things happening in the UK. It's about how we maintain, I agree with Elizabeth, how we maintain the key elements of value within the value chain. We might not be doing all of it, but we should really be making sure we're doing the value add pieces with UK technology. Hydrogen refueling stations, absolutely. If there are no hydrogen refueling stations, no OEMs will be selling us cars. So we do need to balance those both those elements. Fantastic. And then I think maybe moving on to PRTN, we have a question from uh, Pamela Stenger. Um, apologies, I probably completely mispronounced that from Pamela. Uh, and, and the question is, in the context of scale, how important will a national US strategy be for uh, sort of getting the UK, sorry, getting hydrogen up? PSE, and I wondered if you could comment on that. How important is the US in helping actually countries like the UK and Europe and other markets to really unlock this? And uh, maybe is that something that countries like the UK can also help with, which is actually pushing others to deploy hydrogen as well as deploying it itself? I think we. I think it's a it's a question of we we are dealing with a system change. So the more the wider it is, the deeper it appears, the irreversible it becomes. And so then it pushes everyone to indeed invest massively because they know there will be no other solutions. So having the US um, buying in the view that hydrogen will be part of the global energy system for themselves in the future is a way to comfort the ones that have started to invest that they can continue because the market will be deep enough and not only focused on all like Japan and Korea or Germany and France. So it's just giving the breath to the market. Because the, the, it's, we need to basically make sure technology is widely supported and uh, accepted so that the investments that we all have to do, the policymakers and the industry, are basically amortized or depreciated over a wide potential. If US doesn't come in, then it, it's of course going to be slower. So it's going to cost more money. So and and they will be late, and they will be late when the thing is ready. So it's the it's the genuine interest of the U.S. industry, which has a lot of very strong technology players there, to embark into that uh, journey because it's the journey of the next decade. And uh, Mark Reed, I wanted to come to you. We have a question here from Daniel Green about uh, on the panel discussion. There was a lot uh, of references to bankability and business models. And his question is whether flagship project, projects such as the uh, projects in our Saudi Arabia, and you guys, I guess, also refer to projects like H21, whether, whether it's that need for a flagship project that actually will help to unlock these business models, or uh, if actually it's you know, something different. And I wondered maybe with your hat as both an investor, as Anglo-American, and also as someone who's an end user, uh, maybe you could kind of talk about how important you think flagship projects are in this context, or whether that still is part of the sort of pilot narrative as opposed to a widespread rollout narrative? Yeah, I think flagship projects, lighthouse projects, they're, they're critically important um, in any development for any, for any market. So I think when we talk about flagship projects today, we should just be talking about flagship projects that are at scale. Um, so when it is a, uh, for example, I'll use a transport example, you know, if it is a transport one, it's not about the deployment of five buses in, in Aberdeen, right? It's the rollout of 100, 200, 300 stations with, with, with captive fleets. Those, those to me would be flagship uh, projects that are uh, of, of importance and, uh, you know, worth, worth our while today and that will bring the scale that we need. Um, and then there's, of course, um, in applications which... Uh, are less known, but also can have high impact in, in decarbonization. Their, um, you know, flagship projects, for example, in, in mining can mean the deployment of, you know, just a few trucks, uh, big mining haul trucks, or in marine, uh, those are also interesting flagship projects. But to me, as long as flagship is at scale, uh, then that's, uh, that, that's the way to go. Um, and Sam, you sort of said you wanted industry to move past this blue and green um, debate. And, uh, you know, in the question channel, um, there's, there's a flood of questions around blue and green, um, predictably. So I thought I'd come to you uh, and, uh, and ask really the question, 
this is an emotive issue for people, this blue versus green. You know, how do you see, uh, you know, the messaging to the public? How do we explain to people why we need to have the blue and the green? And how do we get industry to sort of, as it were, see each other as complements as opposed to competitors? <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd give you a nice light topic. Yeah, thanks for yeah. that one. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an issue of scale, timing, and cost. So there will be locations such as these industrial clusters where we need large volumes of uh, clean hydrogen to decarbonize industry, where we will not be able to provide properly green, as in from renewables, generated hydrogen at the scale of volume required in the next decade or so. In some areas and regions, I think we'll, we'll have availability of the renewable power and the costs will come down through the supply chain for electrolyzers. In those areas, green hydrogen will be a very viable solution. So again, it's not about one or the other. Uh, Committee on Climate Change is talking about 270 terawatt hours of hydrogen. I think about 10 terawatt hours are made today in the UK. To be, you could not supply all of that in, in the near term or, or by 2050 by only green hydrogen alone. So we need both of them. The other benefit of seeing blue hydrogen as, as a transition is it, it, it will put the infrastructure in place. It will provide this low cost hydrogen to allow us to put infrastructure in place that will then be used by green hydrogen in the future. So this isn't one or the other, it's both of them and needing just to get on and deploy. I thought it was a good answer to a difficult question there. So um, I, I'm going to give, uh, we've got a little bit of time left, um, but I'm thinking in the interest of making the most of it, uh, I'm going to give each of our panelists, um, you know, as I say, one minute to kind of give me a response to this question. And it's a little bit different from some of the ones we've had before, but I wanted to end on a little bit more of an upbeat note. So my question to each of the panel is, what do you each see as the most exciting part of the hydrogen and fuel cell sector transition? What is it that you find is exciting and engaging? And what is it that you tell people, you know, maybe you tell your family members who sigh sometimes when you're still at the computer at 7 p.m. or you tell your friend when you're allowed to leave the lockdown room for a drink or a meal. Or what is it that gets them excited about the sector that you're working in? And, and maybe we'll start with Pierre Tien. Well, it's exciting because this is beyond business. We're just not dealing with performance. We're just not dealing with trying to make a nice profitable project. We're trying to change the world. We're really trying to do so. We're trying to find the solutions to make the world indeed less carbon intensive and, and more sustainable. And, uh, and we are bringing in what the humans have normally best done so far, which is technology and safe and reliable technology. So it, it's, that's why it's so exciting. It's because you're really dealing with something which is far beyond what you're just doing daily. It's, it's, having, it's having an impact. And uh, we have not so many ways in our lifetime to have impacts, and that is one of the ways to have impact if it works. So I think what fascinates me in, in those 10 years already, even more, working on the topic. Fantastic. Uh, Mark, what is it about you? What is it for you? Well, I suppose very much uh, like Pierre, it's it's um, it's this uh, concept that we are actually working to change the world. Um, but also for, for, from again from an investor perspective, I think it's an incredibly exciting space to um, to get into. Uh, so I think there's lots of money to be made, uh, and it's uh, you know good for the world. Sam, lots of money to be made, chance to change the world. Do those sound like the messages that get you excited about hydrogen fuel cells, or is there something else you'd want to leave our audience with? I think it's an exciting place to be. We're at a tipping point. We watched the first hydrogen plane. We've just heard about the first hydrogen train. Things are happening and moving, and they're happening and moving right now. And it is all for good. And it, it is about, yeah, decarbonizing the way we live our lives. 
And Brian, I mean, you know, you've been chairing the panel uh, discussion today. You know, you must be feeling a little bit more inspired after the discussion. What is it that you are sort of excited about listening to this and talking to others in the space? Well, I, I think Sam, Sam stole my thunder, really. Um, as, as I've said before, transport is my thing. And, and um, you know, the positivity that is surrounding these new technologies and applications is really exciting. The hydrogen train, which did its first first on-network journey yesterday in the UK, is, is a really good step forward for a technology that, you know, is, is really looking forward to change the way that we do things from an engineering perspective and for the benefit of people. So I think that, you know, the ability to be looking to the future for a public transport sector that frankly is having a pretty tough time at the moment is, is great to have those those green shoots and, and things to look forward to, to see that there, there is a really positive outlook ahead. Fantastic. And uh, obviously my uh, deputy chair and uh, sort of Rockstar co-partner, Elizabeth Skirrett, can you finish off uh, the panel for us? Give us your, what are you most excited about in this sector? What do you think people should uh, bear in mind if they're trying to get people energised about this? Yeah, I just, I mean, it, the panellists have all said it. I think we cannot underestimate the challenge that exists in front of us. And for me, the exciting thing is working with some of the best and brightest talent that is um, trying to change the world. And I think there's a huge opportunity for younger people who seem to have purpose at their absolute core to expand their skills and to deliver real benefit to society as a whole. Um, and I think um, you know it has the potential to touch every element of our lives. Um, and added to which, it's the opportunity to deliver profit with purpose. Isn't that you know what we're all here to do? It would be really nice. I think that's a very optimistic note for, to finish on, which is what I wanted to hear. Um, I, I want to finish with a few comments. Um, I thought, firstly, a big thank you to all of our panelists. I thought it was an excellent discussion. Reflecting on all of the comments made, something that maybe comes to me here is that sometimes we talk maybe too much around hydrogen and not enough about how we actually use it. And if I think about what got, people got excited about electricity, it wasn't burning coal and running it through a copper line. It was about the fact that they could turn on a light switch in their home. And what's got people excited is the fact that a first commercial plane flew around Cranfield Airfield last week and that the first hydrogen train was running on our railway lines today and that there will be hydrogen double-decker buses in London and you can ride a hydrogen bike around Cardiff or around parts of France or, you know, power a small little fan at home or even a remote gen set in some distant part of the world or even a mining truck. And I would suggest if you've never seen a mining truck running on hydrogen. There are some unbelievable videos online. It is well worth having a look on YouTube to see those things in action. Um, but it does strike me that that really is an important piece that we're missing here and something that, especially for our end users, we maybe should talk about more. Um, I I'm struck by the opportunity as well. I think all the panelists have spoken to this, but every time I talk to people, it just becomes stronger and stronger. That climate change is really the existential challenge that you know everyone in this discussion, and hopefully this one's call, will be spending the rest of their professional careers trying to work to address. It is no mean feat. Uh, I open with some numbers at the beginning around the UK, transitioning over 30 million passenger vehicles, 23 million homes, uh, let alone uh, 180 terawatt hours of industrial heat demand, all to zero emissions by 2050, requires an energy system transition, which we have never seen in human history. But I don't think we should be afraid of that. I think the incredible thing about human ingenuity is how often we are able to do that. And I think with the right sort of strategies and leadership, and I think a lot of great strategies from Europe have pointed the way there, and hopefully with some good strategies from the UK and other markets as well, we will be able to unlock some of that fantastic potential. And I'm encouraged and excited that our panelists were able to talk to some of that, and I'm sure in other panel discussions in the next few months we will learn more. So all that remains is for me to say a huge thank you to uh, everyone for attending, a big thank you to Burgess Salmon for hosting us, and to our panelists, um, so, Bryony e. Thomas, a huge thank you. Um, Sam French, a huge thank you. Elizabeth Skerritt, a huge thank you. Mark Freed, a huge thank you. And, of course, Pierre Tien from, from the Hydrogen Council. Um, I hope all of our audience have a wonderful rest of the day. The audio from this will be made available afterwards. So, if you do want to listen or send this to someone else, please feel free to do so. Uh, there's also a number of emails here. Um, feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much again.